This Week in Startups is brought to you by LinkedIn. You already know LinkedIn as the world's largest professional network. It's also a better way to find great talent. Go to linkedin.com slash twist and get a $50 credit toward your first job post. And Texture. Get unlimited access to all your favorite magazines in a single app. Start your free trial at texture.com slash twist. Twist listeners will continue to get Texture for just $9.99 a month, over 30% off. So, uh, the fastest growing company uh, of the last decade or so has, of course, been Facebook. And I met Chamath Palihapitiya when we were both at AOL. We both broke out. We got out alive. And he went on to uh, become a venture capitalist for a hot minute. And then he met Mark Zuckerberg and decided to go help them grow to a couple of hundred million people. You know, subsequently, they've obviously grown to a couple of billion. And he started investing uh, as a venture capitalist. And he's been studying the venture capital space and saying, how could it be more just? How could it be more fair? How could it be um, more considered? And social capital is his startup. And so we're going to talk with Chamath today about how he's iterating and trying to evolve venture capital with his startup, Social Capital. Please welcome Chamath Palihapitiya. And for those of you who also don't know, he happens to own a small piece of the, uh, or as our friend Phil Helmuth would say. Not small, but okay. Okay, yes. It's gotten bigger, the, the, uh, of the Warriors. That, how, did, how did you wind up, I, I don't even know the answer to this, how did you wind up becoming an owner in the Warriors. Did somebody just call you one day and say, hey, we're going to try to buy this? Uh, no, I was in New York, and uh, I had decided to try to buy the Sacramento Kings. And I went to a meeting with David Stern, and he said uh, something to the effect of, uh, well, this is all fine and great. You know, you seem like an upstanding young man. How much do you think the, the kings are worth? And I was basically like, well, I mean, not much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And I, uh, and I remember I said some number, and uh, he slammed his fist on the table, and he said, if you think it's worth that, you're in the wrong meeting. Wow. I was like, wow. Uh, so I left, and then uh, that weekend, when I had gotten back to California, actually, Helmuth said to me, hey, why don't you meet a friend of mine? He's putting together the ownership group to buy the Warriors. And so I went from trying to buy a whole team to he was like, hey, listen, we need a, another major investor. Join the board. And I was like, oh, this is actually better because I could just write a check and it's in my backyard. And I wanted to have, look, part of it goes back to like, I've always been kind of an investor. Um, I was always trading stocks when I was younger. Even at Facebook, I was a pretty prolific angel investor at the time. Um, and so I kind of knew what I wanted to do post Facebook. And so I wanted to have a hedge. I needed a little insurance policy that I thought could be worth a lot of money so that I could basically take the rest of the capital and be fearless with it. Um, and so I thought, hey, here's a basically you know, an asset that's quite precious. Hmm. They're not making any more of them. And they compound reasonably well. So I thought, and it's uncorrelated to tech, or at the time I thought it was. Yeah. Um, and so I did it. Yeah. And, and I got really lucky. And the timing was amazing because yeah. at the time you bought them, they were cellar dwellers. They were 30-win seasons. Yeah. And now they're a 70-win season <laughs> kind yeah. of team. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of shocking, too. Yeah. It just speaks to good management and a good team. It's not, no different, I think, than any other company. Yeah. Um, so you've been toiling away at social capital trying to figure out how to invest in startups and grow them. And before that, obviously, you were at Facebook seeing this dynamic growth. What have you learned that you didn't know when you started the venture capital firm that you now know and that you wish you knew back then? Um, because when you started, you were a growth person. You understood that growth, but you hadn't invested or had funds. And uh, now you're a fund manager. Well, yeah, I, I think, well, let me answer maybe it in a different way, which is like what's changed in startups. Yeah. And I think what's changed is that now there is just... Um, uh, such a bleeding of talent mm. that's happened. And the reason that's happened is for good reasons, which is, you know, when you think, when you take things like AWS and GCP and you crush the cost of entrepreneurship by an order of magnitude roughly every five or six years, you theoretically should have an order of magnitude more entrepreneurs every five or six years. Um, and so 
you, you look at our business from when I started to today, just in the last seven years, I would tell you that the investable surface area of companies has gone up by somewhere between, you know, five and 10,000 X. They're all over the world, they're all little companies, but each one now suffers from some very meaningful problems. And what they suffer from is a lack of concentration of talent because you cannot, by definition, you know, let's just assume that I'm a reasonable person inside of a company, that I can add value. Well, there's only one of me, right? And so for the every Facebook where I get to work, there are many other companies that maybe could have been Facebook or something close to it where I'm not working. Now, let's take myself out of the example and now take any engineer. Right? or you take any growth person, or you take any marketer, and you recognize the problem, which is we're not creating enough of these people who actually has the experience set to contribute. Yet, the number of companies at the top of the funnel that need those people continues to grow faster, and faster, and faster. And so what happens? What happens is you get a lot of capital going into too many companies unproductively. And that actually breaks the capitalist system. Right? Because then if you're not returning capital fast enough, then the cycle can't repeat. And then the entire system and machinery gets gummed up. And that's what I think is happening right now in the Valley that I think is quite worrisome, which is you've had tremendous amounts of capital deployed on the way in. Very, very few companies that can get to escape velocity. If they do, it's marginal escape velocity. It's not anywhere near as the way it was defined before. And then not enough liquidity on the back end. So everybody's hanging around wondering, are markups what we live on? And if somebody else comes in behind me, is that what I tell my LPs is what success looks like so that I can then go and raise another fund? So what I've learned is that you actually have to now inject. You know, we've, we, we always used to talk about this term value add, and it frankly, it doesn't mean anything. But now I think what organizations like ours need to do is to be the bridge is to have enough human capital where we are some of those experts that any of those smaller little companies may not necessarily be able to get, but then be able to deploy ourselves into a business and make that business better. And if you say it that way, it sounds eerily similar to probably what Amazon said in 2007 with the advent of AWS. And it's not something necessarily just for us to do, it's for everybody to do, which is the following idea, which is Amazon came and knocked on your door and said, you know what, you have DevOps, you have network engineers, they're probably at best second class citizens inside of your technology company. Let me liberate them out of your company and I'm gonna hire them. And inside of AWS, they are the celebrity employee. They are the killer engineer because all we care about is infrastructure, right? And I'm just gonna rent it back to you and you're gonna pay me you know, some nominal cost per month that, you can, that I'm gonna charge your credit card. That made sense. Now imagine if somebody said to you, hey, I'm gonna take care of all of your marketing for you. Hey, I'm gonna give you insights. Hey, you know all of this like space race for like big data? Forget about it, don't worry about it. Just flow the data into this big black box and I'm just gonna send you an email once a month that allows you to understand what you really care about in your business. So now all of a sudden what happens is entrepreneurs have a more precise surface area in which to allocate their time, which is the thing that they care about anyways, right? Because if you think about starting a company, you care about solving a problem, but you have to go through all this indirection to solve the problem. You have to care about HR, you have to care about marketing, you have to care about operations, but you really shouldn't have to care about any of that stuff. You know, if you're trying to sell shoes on the internet, you should be really an expert in picking the best shoes and merchandising them better than anybody else. All the shopping cart optimization, all the cross-selling, all the upselling, all the payments should be done by other people. And should, it should be delivered to you in an abstracted set of APIs that you can consume. So that's my big realization, which is that if entrepreneurship writ large is gonna work, and especially entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley, we're going to go and have to actually be that thing that we've said we were all along but never were, which was value add. Instead of just having six partners cutting checks, you have a SWAT team to come in, study the data, and give you insights, and maybe even help you grow the company yeah. and get it out of the log jam. Yeah, I'll give, you, I'll give you a very interesting example. You know, we went and we started to try to ask ourselves a very simple question, which is, how much do our companies spend on Facebook and Google, the companies that we invest in? And it turns out it's a f ton, okay? And it turns out that it's not just us, but it's literally every single company that's ever raised money from a venture institution or angel investors or a syndicate literally turnarounds and hands probably 30 to 50% of all of that capital back in the hands of Google and Facebook in the forms of CAC, right? Your cost of acquisition. And so I asked a very simple question, which is, well, 
what are the odds that across all these companies, they're probably just competing against themselves and just driving up the cost? And lo and behold, it turns out that on average, you know, a lot of businesses, especially in specific segments, are so competitive with each other that they're bidding up keywords, that they're bidding up inventory, upwards of 40, 50%, 60%, all the way up to 240%. And so I said, well, how would you normalize that? Well, what you'd have to do is you, i.e. some third party, would have to write some function that would allow you to do coherent acquisition, targeted cohorts on behalf of all of the companies in which you're investors in. Now you can imagine what happens. As it turns out, our modeling tells us it, what it would probably do is re redirect 20 to 30% of every single dollar a company raised back into the CEO's hands for him or her to invest in uh, product development or engineering. Does that not seem logical to you that you would do that? Sure. And we have to constantly be asking ourselves, what are tools like that that we should be providing to our portfolio companies so that we're creating an ecosystem of people that can actually win? Meaning it's not just markups after markups after markups with no realizations. That dog doesn't hunt. That's not capitalism. That's venture philanthropy. That doesn't work. It's not a business model. Hey, everybody. Let me take a moment to thank our friends at LinkedIn for partnering with us here on This Week in Startups. Have you tried to hire somebody lately? It is hard. It's brutally hard. I know. I've got many open positions at Inside.com, at Launch, trying to grow This Week in Startups and the Angel Podcast. It's hard to hire people. There is a war for talent today in 2017 going into 2018. It's incredibly hard to find great people. And you know the drill. You post to those job boards and you hope that you're going to find the right person. But let me ask you a question. When was the last time you checked a job board? You didn't. You haven't checked a job board in forever. Most people never check job boards, but there is a place where people go daily to grow professionally and communicate with other senior level executives, and that is, of course, LinkedIn, and 70% of the U.S. workforce is there. You know it as the world's largest professional network. We all do, but it's a great way to find talent. Just ask any of the hundreds of thousands of businesses who have posted to LinkedIn jobs over the past year, yes, LinkedIn jobs, 22 million professionals view and apply to jobs on LinkedIn every week. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't, but I'm telling you right now, 22 million professionals view and apply to jobs on LinkedIn every week. That's week, not year, every week. LinkedIn considered skills, experiences, location, and more to match and promote your job to potential candidates. Think about that. They know your skills. They know your experience. They know your location. So they're matching you with the perfect jobs. That's why 22 million professionals a week are using the uh, jobs boards at LinkedIn. So LinkedIn jobs is 40% higher than job boards at delivering quality candidates. Let me let you have that sink in for a minute. 40% higher than job boards at delivering quality candidates. A biz is only as strong as its people and every single hire matters. You know that if you listen to this podcast, so don't settle for posting and hoping the right person will find you and your role and apply. No, you want to go to linkedin.com slash twist, linkedin.com slash T-W-I-S-T, and you'll get a $50 credit towards your first job post. $50, 50 smackaroos. That's right, linkedin.com slash twist, linkedin.com slash twist for your $50 credit today. Go ahead and go get that $50 credit. Terms and conditions do apply. Thank you again to our friends at LinkedIn. Let's get back to this amazing episode. And we have no, um, we've got a very illiquid IPO market right now. About a third of the number of companies are public now than we're at the peak. And that's creating a liquidity problem that you talk about. People have large stakes in Airbnb, Uber, other companies, and they can't liquidate them, or maybe they can as of next week. We'll see with the SoftBank deal with Uber. But this has created quite a logjam. Is there a solution to these companies going public? And why do you think CEOs are not going public? Our, our friend Bill, Bill Gurley said, hey, listen, you just got to go public and you know, create this discipline and he's pushing companies to, to go public and grow up. Most of these companies don't go public because they don't know their businesses. What does it mean? If you can control your business and you know it, you don't have anything to be afraid of. If you don't and you can't, you do. So the ones that are in control go public. The ones that are not in control stay private. That's true, right? I mean, we can fancifully dress it up like I'm trying to get to scale and I'm, you know, trying to build a monopoly. That's kind of like a bunch of <laughs> The highest quality businesses that can go public should go public. 
And the reason has nothing to do, frankly, with an investor's desire to return capital. It actually has everything to do with the quality of the employees that you have and that you retain. Because at the end of the day, let's take an average company in Silicon Valley. You are now asking engineers and product managers and marketing people, salespeople, good people, to sacrifice the most precious asset that they have, which is their time and their reputation. And they're expected to put that into your hands as CEO on the end, take a reasonable but not great salary, live in one of the most expensive cities in the world, deal with all of the stuff that it entails being in the valley, in return for a theoretical amount of equity upside in the far distant future. At some point, an entire organization and cohort of young people at, who become middle-aged people and who still not have been paid off are going to rise up and be really upset. Your job as a CEO is to build a quality business, and when you can, to find the sources of capital that make your business more and incrementally defensible, not less, and then go public. Because now you have a liquid currency. You can now reward your employees. All of those promises, all of those all-hands talks, all of the bull is no longer bullshit. it's real. There's a compact, right, between the employer and the employee. I'm going to give you, dedicate to you my honest intentions, time, effort, reputation. You're going to give me an opportunity to, to help you advance your organization. And then you're going to pay me. That last part is really important. You have to honestly honor that. And so all these companies that now wait too long, wait too long, wait too long, then what happens? The world changes. Here's an interesting little factoid that Google found. They found that an engineer obsoletes him or herself in about seven years, six to seven years. What does that mean? Roughly 13% of everything is changing every year. So now imagine, if that's true for a Google engineer, don't you think it's true for a company? Don't you think the average utility and a lifetime now of a business may be shrinking? Mm. It's true in the public markets. If you look at the half-life of an S&P 500 company, it's probably true for the half-life of technology companies. So if you're a technology business and you're not trying to find a very fast way to get to product market fit, to scale, to business model assurity, and then liquidity, you're going to be on the wrong side of history, unfortunately, whether you like it or not. Because the few companies that can and then do will have a currency, they'll compensate people, and then all these employees that are working for you will just walk out the door and go to that person. You know, when we recruit at Social Capital, we compete against everybody for a very specific kind of talent. Machine learning, data science, those kinds of folks. And what I can tell you is I only ever lose, we only ever lose a race for human capital to two people, Facebook and Google. There is not a single startup that I've ever lost a high quality person to. This is coming to work for us. Never lost anybody to Uber. I don't care how good you think Uber is. I never lost anybody to Airbnb. I don't care how good you think it is. And the reason is because our equity is certain. Our value and our payback period to our employees is certain. And the only ones that are more certain are Facebook and Google. And so the people that are at the absolute tip of the spear, the single most precious resources of a company now have already figured it out. So in my mind, it only stands to reason that everybody else eventually figures it out as well. So I just think this liquidity problem is really one of the single most important issues of our generation. So there are two solutions that come to mind. One is companies go public. Uh, earlier, uh, or like they used to. Um, another one that we discussed earlier today with Vinny Lingham and uh, Brock Pierce was cryptocurrency and the idea of liquidity uh, on a cap table or liquidity in a fund. Um, and then there's a third one which seems quite innovative, which is the concept of a SPAC. So we discussed already getting to market earlier as an IPO. Let's tackle these two next. The SPAC, which you guys have raised $600 million, I believe, for... 690. 690. And it's sitting there, the special purpose acquisition vehicle, something like well, that? Well, we just call it IPOA. IPOA. So you have IPOA. Tell everybody what that is, why you did it, and this is a publicly trading stock right now, so I guess you have some rules so about I, talking about yeah, it. Yeah, I really... No, we can talk about it now because we're past the quiet period, but I really think solving the liquidity problem is the single most important thing we have to do. And the reason is because it'll allow us to build the next great generation of visible companies. And it'll give the CEOs of those businesses a liquidity instrument, which is the stock that they can use to not just compensate people, but to frankly acquire companies, to grow inorganically as well as organically, to, to show strength to their customers. 
These are all very good things to align their employees around performance management, operating in a you know monthly and quarterly cadence, by the way, isn't bad. It doesn't mean like you throw your yearly or five-year goals out the window. It just means you have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, you can't just like bake on mission and values in year five of a company. Okay, you got to be able to like put one foot in front of the other, ship code, get product market fit and scale. So what I said is like, hey, let's just go and make it simpler for this liquidity problem to get solved so that we can give our best performing CEOs a really powerful tool that they can use to grow their business and win. And so the way ours works is in a typical IPO, you know, you, you're talking about spending 12 to 18 months in a process that you don't control with bankers whose incentives are, you know, they're not, they're not disingenuous, they're just different than yours. Their job is to pay off the relationships that, you know, they have with their own customers. And we just found a very clever way of reusing a product that the financial industry has refined over decades as a backdoor mechanism to an IPO. So it's just kind of hacking the system. It allows you to be public in 90 days snap your fingers, you're out. You know, it allows you to put the stock in the hands of people you can control, and it works for any size company. And so why I think that's important is what I would like to see are more businesses embrace the discipline and the vision and the, frankly, the courage it takes to just go out and just deal with people's judgment of you. This is not kindergarten soccer anymore. Right. Some businesses are good and some businesses are <laughs> and most businesses are in the middle. And so the real question is, can you help the companies in the middle get closer to good and avoid So with this special, this IPOA, the way it works is you raise this money, it sits there. So the $690 million sitting somewhere and then you can acquire a company or acquire a stake That's in the, the hack. That's the hack is basically that, you know, for example, like if you said, did WhatsApp go public? You would say, no, it was acquired by Facebook. Well, I would say yes, but that's effectively like going public because now the WhatsApp stock was traded for Facebook stock that was public. And so similarly, we have a company which is public. It's called IPOA. And so if we were to acquire a company, any of your companies, you would instantly be public. And it would just- Could you acquire multiple or it has to be a single? Uh, I think we're gonna focus on one, probably really big one, just to prove the point. Mm. Um, and then after that, absolutely, you could have multiple. And you could, like I said, we, we, we've kind of like had this idea, once A is done, we have IPO B through Z kind of reserved in the NYSE. We're just gonna keep firing them out constantly. Um, so you go to a founder who's got an at-scale business and say, we'll buy $690 million in stock, take yeah. it public, yep. and then you guys get some carry on that 690 or something, like a regular investment. Yeah, well, we actually just get stock. You just get so, some Yeah, and frankly, stock. like in most cases, we would invest more into the IPO and just lock ourselves up. So um, yeah, it's, it's quite a good thing. Again, it all goes back to this idea. What do we need to make company building more logical and more successful on the whole? Mm. And I think this generation has to answer those questions. Business model quality, meaning how do you focus on what you're truly good at and cede some control to other people? Because the reality is with the amount of money that you raise, it's just not logical anymore that you can do everything. And you have already made that value trade off in your mind to Amazon. And so now the question is who are other people like that that can give you services and capabilities that you need? And well, I mean, there's also law firms and Trinet and you know, outsourcing your HR. Yeah. So all these things have existed. It's just uh, in your mind, you have to open up the aperture a bit to, to see other things way, being. Yeah, the way that we think about it is like, you know, if you think about like Amazon is like PaaS, right? And there's like, or IaaS, whatever you want to call it, like infrastructure platform as a service. Now I think there's knowledge as a service and there's all this capability that people should be able to plug into via APIs. Mm. You send me your data, I send you back the answer. I mean, if I could tell all of you guys, hey, listen, I have a team of 50 people. We've been trained at Facebook, Instagram, Google, PayPal, all the best of the best kind of companies. All we do is build infrastructure for machine learning and data science that allows companies to grow. We understand North Star metrics and we help companies grow. Like, why wouldn't you just plug into that? Mm. Of course you would. So our job, I feel like now, is to become more technological. So we've been in the business of investing money. We will continue to do that. We'll continue to do a lot of investing in, in sort of like the, the venture and the seed spaces and do it increasingly all around the world. But now it's, that's like, like now no longer just the only thing. It has to be followed very quickly with this idea of, and here's our you know, documentation about how our APIs work. Pass that to your engineering team and figure out what services that we've built you can use. 
Is it marketing automation to streamline the way you spend on Facebook and Google? Is it some cohort analysis? Is it some machine learning to understand pricing? Is it you know, us running your A-B testing infrastructure for you? If we've learned across tens or hundreds of companies and we continue to learn, you benefit from all of that. And I think we have to do that on behalf of the companies now that we invest in. And then as part of that toolkit of making a company successful, we need to give the CEO by year seven or eight an answer to how you pay your employees. Because otherwise, I think your employees are going to turn around and walk out the door. Hey, everybody. Let me take a moment to tell you about Texture. Yes, Texture. And it is an awesome new service that gets you magazines right to your devices. And magazines are great for writing and beautiful photography to tell stories better, expand your knowledge, and entertain you. Of course, National Geographic takes you further away. The Atlantic gets you to the heart of the issue. And People Magazine helps you relax while Wired and Vogue let you see the future. But quality of magazine should be available anytime without needing to carry them around or have them clutter up your home. And the answer to that conundrum is Texture. Texture is an app that delivers unlimited access to over 200 premium magazines right now. And you can try Texture for free. Imagine having all your favorite magazines and the back issues anytime, anywhere. So here's your call to action. You're going to want to go try texture.com slash twist, texture.com slash twist. And if you choose to continue, my podcast listeners get texture for just $9.99 a month. That's 30% off the listed price. Go to texture.com slash twist and you can start your free trial today. Once again, Texture, T-E-X-T-U-R-E dot com slash twist. It's an amazing product. It's gorgeous. And you really get to get in those back issues and see what's been going on in the world and get that high, high quality uh, design, photography, and writing all together in one app. It is a must. Go check out texture.com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. Let's talk a little bit about cryptocurrency now. You have decided to do a SPAC. You continue to raise funds. You haven't done uh, a crypto fund to invest in giving your LPs liquidity. I keep hearing that as the number one reason to put your next fund on the blockchain. Is it about liquidity? I think, I think, all, these, I think all these people are getting queued at the edges, and it doesn't matter. Sell the companies, then return the money. Hmm. That's how funds work. Yeah. Not chopping it up into a thousand little pieces in f-ing cryptocurrency. Like this is all like stop at the edges. All this stuff is, not, is nonsense at the edges. Get back to core fundamental business principles. When you raise capital from others, okay, and let's, re- let's realize who those others are. These are good, honest, hardworking people. They are the pension funds. They are, you know, um, the balance sheets of hospitals. They are endowments. They are foundations doing great work. They don't need a cryptocurrency and a f-ing wallet. Right. <laughs> they give you money to get more money so that they can go and cure cancer. That's what they're trying to do. They can't give a token to somebody with cancer and say, here, here's, your, here's a token. Do you feel better with your token? <laughs> Meanwhile, some scientists is there like, I need $4 million to, you know, to create a wet lab. Well, sorry, I have a token. Here, take this token. I've chopped this up. It represents 95 95- any companies you've never heard of. Right. It's a joke, yeah. Jason. Yeah. That's a joke, right? Like, this is what I'm saying. We have to grow up. Let's all grow up, mm. OK? We are supposed to be the tip of the spear for the future. If you're going to do that, put on your big boy and big girl pants and f-ing do that. Right. OK? Build great businesses. Make a lot of money. Return them to the people that helped you do it. Rinse and repeat. Right. It really isn't that hard. And it's all of the intellectual navel-gazing that gets in the way of that, which I think is very problematic. That's what people on the outside, inside here, say, wow, those guys are such complete dilettantes. Their heads are firmly up their asses. Instead of make a company successful and go public, we are like, let's create a token. The token will represent the tokenized, atomized unit of value creation. Describe- Man, shut the f*** up. Yeah. So venture is not going to be completely disrupted That's by coins. That's not the point. Venture will be disrupted by people creating value in the way of tools and capabilities for entrepreneurs. That's how it gets disrupted. It's not going to get disrupted by, again, intellectual kind of like at-the-edges nonsense. It's fine. Do it. 
an ICO will not change the illiquidity crisis. It will not make any of the companies in your portfolio better, will it? No, maybe it'll allow the investing GP of a fund to cash out. Okay, great. Now we've just made the problem even worse because now they're even less incentivized than they are today. Mm. That's not what we need. We need to professionalize what's happening in Silicon Valley. We need to upscale it. We have to get it out of this cottage industry, guys. We have to run this thing at scale now, okay? Scale means I give you things. You have expectations of me that are contractual in nature. And in return, I get things from you. Big boy and big girl pants time. Right. Building companies is hard. That's what it takes. That's what we have to do. That's going to require me not being greedy, you not being short-sighted, and us figuring it out how to do it together. Slack's the big win for you uh, to date, I would, I would guess, in the funds? One of many. One of many, but it seems like the real outlier. I mean, they just that's raised that seven or eight billion. No, that's not true. I mean, look, at one point we own 5% of all Bitcoins. You do that math. Yeah, it's a lot. So look, I mean, look, here's the thing, like, you know, it's a fantastic company. I just came from uh, Slack's board meeting. I love Stuart. I love that team. I think it's, it has the potential to be unassailable. Um, but here's, here's where I think Slack um, is an amazing company, not because of the theoretically the amount of money that it could make us, but it's because that is a team that is incrementally every day getting more and more smart about their business. They're getting better and better at focusing on the things that they are exceptional at. And to me, I think that, again, goes back to that's the muscle memory that's worth repeating. And what's great about our working relationship is, you know, we've been in the bowels helping them wherever we can at the edges since we invested. And I feel really validated about that. I don't want any credit for that, but that's what I think we should celebrate, that there are these people, my partners, some of you will have heard from them, you know, Andy Arts, Jonathan Sue, um, Rayco. They're unsung heroes um, because... They don't think about the context of what does this represent as a line item in some report we sent to investors. It's we're in the bowels of that company trying the best we can as they try the best that they can. And I think that's what's worth talking about. Because that's repeatable, by the way. For sure. Yeah, rolling up your sleeves and doing the work. Well, especially then, <laughs> if you, then if you, again, then if you do it enough times, you say, well, let's just rebuild that in software, right? I mean, it's, it's, and then you start to do stuff. And that, I think that could be really cool. Let's um, shift as we wrap up here to the state of the nation and the world, as it were. Um, Dow broke 23,000. Uh, the country has never seemed more divided. The world has never seemed more unstable, at least in our lifetimes. Maybe after 9-11 felt a little more unstable. Uh, but it's a very um, schizophrenic feeling these days, isn't it? What's your take on what's happening in the world and how this Trump presidency and this bull market um, resolves itself well, one way or the other. We have to separate these two things. Right. Uh, I would say in terms of the presidency, we're learning about how constructively resilient the governance model of the United States is. There are these checks and balances, and as much as you can get whipped up by the media on either side, the reality is what is said and what is done have been, as a matter of fact, two very, very different things. Even if you talk about his executive orders, what has actually been implemented are two very different things. If you talk about what's, what's, what's attempted to have been legislated and what has been legislated, two very different things. And I think what that proves is the resiliency and the governance of how the United States works. So the reality is, I think what we need to take away instead is, if this was meant to protest a certain set of conditions that people believed are wrong in society, I think we've all realized that they're saying something. Now it's important to figure out what that is and then to fix it. Part of it goes back to what I just said, which is we all have to legitimize ourselves in a way and join the conversation that we haven't done before. We've all gotten away with, again, being the West Coast San Francisco dilettantes. I specifically have loved bathing in that role. It's got to stop. It's got to stop. Now we are sort of like the leadership that has to decide. And so we have to just take our place at the table and do that work. So that's the Trump thing. In terms of the economy, look, here's the reality. When you actually take a step back and look at the last 30 years, basically what has happened is we went from real rates that were basically you know, 18, 19, 20%, and we've now gone to real rates that are zero. 
And the last five years, along the way, as rates have been zero, we've also printed trillions of dollars of cash and introduced it into the economy. And we are now going through very uncharted territory now, which is the great unwind of quantitative easing. We don't know what the implications of that are. And where do rates go from here? And by proxy, where does the economy go? We spend a lot of time trying to figure that out because we invest capital across the entire spectrum from early stage in venture all the way through to uh, public markets. And so we have to think about this. Um, it is the scariest time to invest, in my opinion, in the public markets right now. Um, typically, you know, we would run lots of leverage. We are comfortable running lots of leverage, which means for every dollar, you know, we spin it up to two or three dollars and we put it to work. And it takes a lot of complexity to manage that kind of risk, but we've done a good job. And I would tell you right now, we're the exact opposite. For every dollar we're given, we probably have 40 cents in cash. And uh, I am cautious. Um, and, I, uh, and the reason is because uh, this whole kind of like, you know, good times, things melt up. When enough people believe it, that's exactly when something discontinuous to the downside tends to happen. Um, and again, we have to see now what happens when these trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars um, get taken up. And uh, I don't think anybody knows. But it can't be steady state markets ripping up. Right. We could have the markets seize up and go sideways for a decade like Japan. Or I think, I think that's, that's uh, quite likely, quite honestly. Um, and then the real question is, what are the catalysts to the downside? And then what do you do? And then what does it mean for all of us? I think really what it means for all of us, again, going back to where we started, is we have to really hunker down and get our business models working. And we have to start figuring out how to partner across companies or across institutions to give operational leverage to as many businesses as possible so that you can have escape velocity. Because if winter is coming, which it will, and it will be harsh, you have to be prepared. You can't be giving 50 cents of every dollar that you have to Facebook and Google and expect to survive. That's not going to be tenable, right? It's just not. And in the absence of growing virally and automagically, you're going to be spending money somehow. And really understanding why you're spending that money, what you're getting for it, how to make it super efficient, is probably the first order of business for every single company right now, while it seems like the fun can't stop. What are your thoughts on the seed and early stage uh, becoming less attractive to venture capital firms? They seem to be, you know, what, well, just candidly, what used to be an A is now a B. What used to be a, a B is now, I don't know, a C. And so think, I think this is, this is like, how do these all connected? They're all connected, right? Yeah. It's like, so think of what's happened. All this money by the Federal Reserve gets introduced over the last four or five years, right? They're out there putting money in the system, buying up assets. All these people now have all this money. What do they do? They go and they inflate the equity markets. They also go to their, you know, they're an investor in social capital or Sequoia. And then all of a sudden, instead of a $400 million fund and being 1x oversubscribed, it's a $500 million fund and we're 6x oversubscribed. What do we do? We're like, oh my gosh, well, we're not going to do the same, you know, more deals. We'll do the same deals. Well, now all of a sudden, you know, a $5 million check becomes an $8 million check. So you see how this kind of inflation just naturally happens, right? And then those same investors now get less allocation. And so they say, well, wait a minute. You know, we only did venture, but I think we should do seeds now because those are big. So we can get money working there too. And so now there's an entire ecosystem of seed investors. And so um, to me, what was the question? Well, what is your yapping. take? What is your take on venture capitalists ah. kind of seeding the the early stage? Is that a dangerous thing for them to do, or is it the it only is. thing they can? It do? is. It really, really is. Um, but again, it goes back to you have to use some amount of tooling and software now to help you prosecute smaller and smaller quantums of money into companies, um, because in the absence of doing that, a good industrious angel network of people, you know, for example, like how you do your syndicates, like today, right now, your syndicates are only capital. But imagine if your syndicates also became capability and capital, meaning four of the people were marketing experts, and now you deployed those people inside of a company, right? That's like pretty plausible. You know, imagine there was a lawyer. Oh, you're writing it down. Good. But my point is syndicate. I, no, I, I have, you're smart enough where you'll just eat people's lunch. And so uh, I think what venture, I think what, I think venture right now is in, uh, is in a very uh, structurally troubled place. So it's it, in the former, I would say, in the context of people who've done it in a very traditional way are stuck 
they're kind of like, they're like, what do I do? They're seized because they only know one way to do it and they're not quite sure how to fix it. And then other people at the edges who have no you know, vestige of the past, you, me, others are like, oh, here's how we would redo it. And uh, I think it's going to completely reshape the category. It's very interesting because these syndicates are now getting so large, we hit 2,000 members in ours, that it fills up and people kind of get annoyed that they weren't able to get in. But if we were to say, hey, this deal is looking for marketers and data scientists. Yeah. The marketers and data scientists get first shot at the equity in it. And then if there's anything left, the rest of the syndicate goes. But you have to agree to be available. So we could actually just great have all 2,000 syndicates fill out what is their skill set yeah. and what is, how many hours can they give to the startup Yeah. And by the way, as the, part of it. There's such a long tail of services that are represented that, that companies would love to have that help. And now, you know, if you made an investment and what you really had were 10 people in your syndicate, each providing you know, a few hours a week, that's the equivalent of one to two people, truly, right? That can go a long, long way for a young company trying to get to the next stage. So to me, like those kinds of innovations, I think are really necessary. Um, and I think they should happen. And I think it'll render the existing class of traditional venture investors in a really troubled position because they will have such a hierarchy around how they've done things that these kinds of ideas will just seem so foreign to them that they'll ignore them and they'll laugh at them, and then it'll be too late. All right, on that note, let's give a big round of applause to Shamath Palihapitiya. Well done. So I've been friends with David for a while. A while. <laughs> Going to date ourselves if you... Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, an exact number. And you were at... Time Warner at one point in time, yeah, that's when right. Time Warner bought my company, that's right. AOL, back in the day. And uh, you were a key, I learned after the fact that you were a key maker in that decision. That they came to you and said, should we buy this or not? I think you're and building you up my, my role, uh, yes. But. but true or not true, because we never discussed this, but you were, you gave it the thumbs up. Yeah, and it turned out to be exactly right. Uh, yeah. your, your company turned into uh, a huge part of what helped AOL keep going and, and evolving. Yeah, and yeah. now the person who spearheaded that, Jim Bankoff, then went yeah. and took that same playbook, evolved it, and did Vox. Right, in so fact, Jim and I became friends through, through that deal. Oh, was that it? Because yeah. he was the crazy champion. Yeah, that's right. And at the time, I remember I met with Don... Logan. Logan, yep. who was the old school Time Warner person. And this deal was hanging on a string, from what I'm told, in retrospect, <laughs> because he basically, the deal was going to not happen, and I said, well, can I talk to the guy who said no? And this guy was Don, and it was like, he's going to whatever conference, you can come to Time Warner Center, you have 20 minutes with him. And he said, my daughter has blogs on this thing, and I don't know why we're paying $30 million for a bunch of blogs. And I was like, oh, it's more like magazines, and he was like, oh, it's magazines? Great. Okay, fine. And I was like, okay. And that was my first big score. So thank you for being supportive. If literally this whole monster that's been created, you played a role in. So Well, uh, not, not surprising that so many entrepreneurs come to this conference and, and want to interact with you because you've lived this. You've seen this, the movie before. Right. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. So story. You, you went to Samsung, I don't know how many years ago, eight years ago? No, six years ago this January. Six years. Which is a record for me. I've never been at one place for that long before. And I remember when you were taking the job, we were all like, hmm, why are you going to Samsung? What was your original thesis of why to go there? And then how has it played out over the last six years? Yeah. So my original thesis was, like probably many of you all, I'd, I'd certainly heard of Samsung, um, had a TV in my house, um, and uh, saw the ads all over the place uh, and respected the, what the company did. Um, but I wasn't really familiar with the company. And when I got there, I found out, or when I was thinking about going there, to your question, uh, I found out that they sold more than 500 million displays a year. Think about that. And uh, I met the head of the TV group, and he told me they sell two TVs a second. Mm. I thought, my goodness, that is a huge footprint. And what I realized was that increasingly these displays were going to get connected to the internet. Mm. 
And over time, they could get connected to each other. And I thought, if you could actually connect all these things together, you'd actually have one of the largest platforms in the world for distributing content and services, which is where yep. you and I come from, or apps and ads and any manner of things. And, and um, I went in with this idea that this company, through its hardware footprint, might have a really great chance of being a real player in the software right. side of the house. And your thesis, additionally, I remember talking to you early on, was startups would play some role in this. Yeah. And so you had to convince people who are making literally billions of dollars a quarter off of smartphones and televisions, or yeah. tens of billions, that tiny startups were worth paying attention to. Take me to that moment where you're talking to the brass in Korea yeah. about, hey, we, sh we need to be involved in startups, right. and what their reaction is to something that's so small and nascent, and why, how did you convince them that they should put this amount of effort into it? Because the amount of effort you're putting into, which we'll get into in a bit, is actually very significant, yeah. uh, and to convince them to do it, I think... It's not normal. Most of the time, they just have an M&A department over here on the side, and if something gets really big, they buy it and they overpay. But to get down into the weeds and participate with startups so early is, is something very new. You, know, you, you always had Intel putting a million dollars into every deal in Silicon Valley, but that was a, this is a distinctly different process that you've chosen. What was it like to convince them? Yeah, so the, the, the company was convinced and it's filled with lots of smart people and, and they knew what you know and what other companies know and that is for the future, for, to be a thriving company in the tech space, you have to understand both hardware and software. Mm. You have to figure out a way to thoughtfully integrate the two. And they were working with software companies, usually licensing content and meeting with uh, software companies. And, and at the same time, they were spending, uh, and I should say we, we spend uh, on, in any given year 12 to $14 billion in R&D every year. And I said, that's great, but at least on the software side of the house, you know that most of the innovation historically has tended to come from startups mm. and not big companies. So, uh, uh, you know, keep on going with the big company uh, development and research on the software side, but let's form a group that's focused exclusively on startups. Right, and that's what Next is. And, and that's what Next is. And um, uh, what, what, we, what we are is a startup within this very large company, and we focus on startups. Uh, what we're trying to do is identify transformative software and services to complement the hardware. And we do it with all these functions that Jason's putting up here. So yeah. what, what, we, what I told our company is, let's have a group that meets entrepreneurs wherever they are. So if you have an idea and you are one person or two people, we can help turn it into a product. If you have a product, we can help turn it into a company. Uh, and if you have a company, we can help take you global and give you scale. And, and this is why we have uh, the first ever US-based venture fund, and we do early stage investments. Uh, we have a partnerships group that connects you not only with my group, but other groups across Samsung. Um, we have an acquisitions group, which you alluded to. Samsung had not really didn't have a history in doing software acquisitions. And in the last three years, we've done 23 acquisitions. Um, and we also have our own, our own internal product development. So we have it all in one place. And the, and the argument to the folks internal was by having people who are dedicated to startups who come from that space, who speak that language, we can accelerate our entry into new spaces. Mm. And to their credit, uh, they got behind it and they've been really supportive. I think one of the... Um best examples is smart things i had met this company when they were an independent company yeah how did you meet smart things and what stage was that company at and what were they doing when you right. met them uh, i actually met alex hawkinson at a conference much like this and i was introduced to him um by one of his investors actually it was reed hoffman reed hoffman yeah yeah and uh and uh, we got to talking and he started talking about having one open platform so that different companies' products could come into one place and that you could control a smart home, a connected home through one app. Rather than having a dedicated app for one device, imagine a house with 12, 13, 14 different devices. It wouldn't make sense to open up all these different apps. And so he was building a platform. 
And it made me think of what I, I just told you about, about having all these displays and devices connected to each other. And I told him about the reason why I joined Samsung and he told me about what he was trying to build. And initially I thought I was gonna invest in him. And I thought, you know, there were about 50 people. They were a bit of a startup darling, yeah. if you recall. This was uh, over three and a half years ago. They were literally on the cover of Wired Magazine and yep. Time and everything. But they were a scrappy startup. And um, at the, I, I said, we should just acquire this company. And rather than putting them into a particular part of Samsung, they became part of my group because I wanted them to have access to all the different divisions of the company. But we also thought it was important to stay independent and so they are an independent subsidiary. They have their own developer community. They run their own business. They just announced a deal with ADT to launch a security service, which is great. And come full circle, um, this is one of my favorite stories, and, and hopefully you guys will like this. Um, when I met uh, Alex, it was, let's say, April of, uh, was that, 2014. We acquired them in August. So the following January at CES, he was on stage as part of the keynote at CES. The year before, they could not get space on the CES space. They couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford it. You couldn't yeah, get it. They could get it. They couldn't. They didn't have yeah. the money for it. Didn't, it. it didn't. It wasn't. It didn't make sense. Right. It would not have been a frugal. That's use right. Of a ju judicious use of capital. <laughs> That's right. But you have very little. Right. So they rented a, ho a house off the strip. They got a, uh, they rented one of these big sort of minivan type things and they carted a journalist to this demo home to try to show them what a connected home of the future could look like. And then at, at night, they rolled out sleeping bags and slept on the floor. Yeah. Okay. And so fast forward a year later and he's on stage giving a keynote at CES. Right. And today, as we speak, uh, Samsung is, uh, we have our annual Samsung developer conference. We just announced today that every division in Samsung is getting behind, not just on the platform itself, but we had different brands somehow related uh, to, to the IoT space. No surprise, we're 325,000 people. Basically every division is embracing the SmartThings brand. And so when we reach out to partners, developers, and, and actually release our own IoT products, they're going to be branded smart things. And for me, that's an amazing story given that a few years ago, the company really didn't have deep relationships with startups. And now a startup, which is still independent, is helping lead the way into what we think is going to be one of our biggest growth, growth it seems areas. seems like the big companies have gotten better at not crushing the small companies after they buy them. Yeah. I think Google gets a little bit of credit for this with YouTube. They kind of put them in their own building. What's the best practice there in terms of intelligent M&A? Yeah. Because you're kind of defining that as you go. Well, I, I was and, there. In fact, I, I led the integration of YouTube after we acquired yeah. it. Uh, and, there, it, and obviously, it wasn't just me. There were a lot of people. But that was one of the big things. And it turns out there's pretty obvious, simple things like retaining your identity and your culture. So keeping your email addresses, mm -hmm. um, having your own space. Um, keeping we, your email addresses, what an obvious one. Right. That they always get wrong. It's like, you bought our company, and now we have to be dot .nbc dot .i dot .universal dot, you know, like... I try to email somebody at CNBC and it's like literally they're nbci.universal. I'm like, <laughs> if you buy another company, right. it's going to be, you know, apple.nbc.universal.intel.com. <laughs> like how many well, subdomains are we going to do on this email address? It, Let it, them be cnbc.com. Well, it, it reflects this idea of being acquired. Right. Like taken over in a way and it's almost like being dominated like we're going to put our flag over your ship that's right like planting yeah. flag well and, and 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 most of the time it comes with the best intentions right uh, but what happens is the very thing that made the startup so successful and attractive in the first place is in risk of being watered down or actually just crushed and so i think google has done that well and, and if you look at our smart things example what we what we have done is we've taken pains to provide a bit of a a buffer um, so they can continue to do the things that are important to them, yet still have a connection and, and, and frankly leverage the large scale resources of a large company like this. And, and, and that's one of the big learnings for me. I mean, even in, uh, in the last couple of years, it, it turns out um, because we have a venture fund and, and I, I saw Brendan out there. Brendan. Yeah, Brendan was at Brendan Kim time. runs our, our venture fund. Uh, he writes the checks. <laughs> that's right. Um, and one of the things that uh, he and I absolutely recognize among the, the startups we invest in is you set up this idea of what success is and you think about an exit, right? You think about having an IPO or being acquired. And one of the things that I've come to appreciate is that an acquisition, while absolutely being an opportunity to 
uh, to celebrate and to enjoy some of the, the fruits of your labor can really just be the beginning of the next stage of evolution. I mean, it, it really is for you finding a partner, frankly, who can help supercharge the next phase of your growth and help you take you to a further goal than, than getting acquired. Right. It, it almost is a means to a further end. And so if you can think about acquisitions as a, a form of business development or partnership, if you can find the right acquirer, it, they will absolutely help you realize hopefully bigger bigger dreams, bigger goals. And things are, the world is getting so large and interconnected right now. I'm fascinated by the ecosystem's development. I, m one of my understandings is that at Samsung, Apple is such a huge customer of Samsung's screens and I guess GPUs and oh, I don't know exactly which components, but they're one of your biggest customers. This is true, yeah? So although you sell five to one, I, I don't know, it's five to one or 10 to one, the number of phones is Apple, you still have economics in every Apple phone sold. Yeah, what, uh, I think there's been some things written recently about yeah. it. I, you know, we, we don't, uh, so I'm on this, there's three divisions at Samsung. Right. There's a mobile division, there's a consumer electronics division where TVs are sold, and there's a components division. Right. There's a very strict and uh, thick wall between the components business and what the consumer facing businesses where they sit. And so I work with the consumer facing yeah. businesses. So I, I, am, I don't have intimate knowledge of the components business, but what I would say is that they uh, are absolutely in business with many companies, uh, not just the one uh, you described, but yeah. a lot of companies that we'd be competing yeah. with. And in fact, there's lots of companies that are in different places in the supply chain Right, uh, and, and, and that's one, another learning that uh, I didn't fully appreciate until I got to Samsung where um, the world is so interconnected and large companies play so many different roles. You have to get comfortable with the idea of on some level competing with one part of a company while also co cooperating with another part of, right. uh, of that same company. And uh, I think back in the old days, it was if you get acquired you're conquered you know if you you're either a friend or an enemy that sort of thing and i think it's not quite as black and white you guys have done 66 investments to date uh, yeah. i believe is the last count that's right um what do you look for in a company when you're deciding to do it are you looking to lead the round are you looking to participate in a round that's established what is the general footprint and, and what make what makes an investment a no-brainer for your team yeah um, well, we generally go early stage uh, from seed to, let's say, Series B is our sweet spot. Um, average investment check size is about a million, but you know, we've invested a, a few hundred thousand and we've invested uh, significantly more than a million. Um, we invest in different spaces, but we have priority areas, things like security um, and uh, authentication and uh, AI, things that would make the experience on the device better. Uh, but we've also, in more recent years, looked in areas where that combination of hardware and software, if well integrated, can create standout experiences. So a few years back, we started investing in VR long before we came out with a headset because we thought, hey, if we can get the hardware and the software together, then you can have a great experience. We're, we're doing the same with AR uh, these days. And of course, IoT, we, we thought about that a lot. Um, to your question about what makes uh, a company attractive, it's the things and themes that I think you would be repeating to your folks and that you've been so great about. Um, it's obviously you, the concept and the idea is important, but at the end of the day, it's really about execution. Yeah. So what you're, what you're doing early on is you're making a judgment about the founder and that, and that team about will they be able to ex execute. Mm. And it's... Um, a lot of times it's more art than science, so you look for other clues. Sometimes the clues are, hey, Jason's really interested in this company, mm -hmm. and we really respect and like Jason, so it could be other co-investors. And so while we're open to leading, we, we will join a syndicate um, more times than not. Uh, another is um, having someone who has seen the movie before mm. and has and done well, and, and, and especially for us. And so uh, we're super loyal to folks that we've worked with before and that we trust a lot. Uh, so those are, are pretty big signals. How does a founder, when they're looking at an emerging space, what's your best practice 
for them surviving long enough to see the tide come in. Yeah. Because a lot of times it's super exciting to jump into VR, let's say a year or two ago, to jump into wearables three years ago, or maybe to jump into AR this year, yeah. or voice this year. Yeah. But let's face it, if you made an app for watches, there may not be critical mass enough to actually build a business there, but you as Samsung or other people making watches really want there to be an app community. Yeah. How does one as a founder know or manage that delicate timing? Because it does seem to me that the watch is taking a long time uh, although you guys just launched a new one. I saw last night on the NBA. Is that the one they were showing on no, this inside is, the NBA last this night? This might be the last generation. Two? Or I think it's gear three. This is new? three. This is three. We've, I four. think we've now had uh, eight or nine different versions of a wearable. Right. You know, there's fast iteration. Yeah. W when is that going to be ready for prime time? Do you think it, it is ready? Does that have the like uh, LTE built into it now? We, we had that two years ago. Yeah, I remember uh, that one. Yeah, two years yeah. ago. Yeah. The, so the answer is you're never, you're never quite sure. Right. Uh, you, you don't know because sometimes there is a bit of a chicken or egg. Yeah. Uh, because sometimes a, a market needs to be made because there is that killer app or experience that just shows you mm. what it could be. And other times you, you kind of have to uh, wait it out and you remind yourself it's more of a marathon, not a sprint. And I, 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 I think, I don't know that there's a blanket rule. What, what I will say though is um, having people around you who can also be nodes in the space, gathering information and observation is really critical. Mm. So not being too inwardly focused and, and, and falling in love with just your product and the vision you have for it. And that can come from a board or investors. Mm -hmm. It can come from peers that you meet with and interact with, even socially. Right. When you're just kind of venting about what's going on. Right. That can be really valuable context because sometimes when you're just working on your thing and seeing your thing, no one's pressure testing it. Mm. And, and, and wishful thinking does not a market make necessarily, right. um, but it's also an important ingredient. In fact, you can't make a market without it, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure I, I, there's a really clear, crisp answer. There's things that you can do to maximize the potential. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it's just, just talking to yourself and having good people around you to say, there will be a market for this, but it will likely take time. So how should you, how should you manage your burn? Right. Managing burn seems to be something that people in VR did not do well. They, they raised a bunch of money and they just started spending as if we would hit 100 million headsets, and we haven't. And it's going to take a little bit of time, right? When do you think people will be using VR, you know, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 million people will put it on a day and use it every day? Do you think we're two or three years out from that? Is it next Christmas? Is it this Christmas? When are we going to see this explosive adoption of VR? I know it's crystal ball time, but... Yeah, it, it, it's hard to say only because it's possible that something could happen to really spike it right. soon. And, and I think a couple of things have to, have to happen. One is, um, it turns out that the original best VR experience was a tethered experience to a very expensive PC. Yeah. And the whole mobile thing was an interim yeah. experience and um, analogy is even in gaming you know the best gaming experience was on a pc or a console right and the mobile app thing was an interim like snacking experience right and and so you have cases where the interim technology the interim experience became the, the big, big thing the right? angry birds yeah right right Crash so, your plans. and so um a couple things have to happen one is there has to be the angry birds a moment. VR yeah. moment. And there has to be, um, frankly, something about the hardware side of the house that makes it more accessible, not just in terms of price, but where it is lighter, it is more convenient, it, you, you don't feel it as much. And I think now we have enthusiasts and people who once they try it, they're really into it. Mm. But that, that sampling, you know, w w you pass by that, that sausage on a toothpick at the store, it yeah. just, there's no, there's no downside to just sampling, yeah. it, right? What's the equivalent of that in your world, whether it's VR or not? And, and VR needs to see that. It's like we were setting up VR booths and shopping malls across America at all the music festivals and all that. Uh, and that's one part of it. And we're trying to stimulate the ecosystem, but all the different other parts have to fall into place. You know, the, the content makers, the sponsors, the people who have brand messages that they want to get out there yeah. and the audiences, right? But yeah. so, so the answer is, I'm not sure, but we, we're, still, we're still big believers in it. And if you see some of the startups, at least that I've seen, there will be a day when it will be 
as easy and in fact more sought after to create a hologram of yourself or an event to put into VR or an AR experience as it is today to take a photo. And there are companies out there that are building it right now. And once you see even a, a, a sample of this and understand how much more immersive the experience is, you know it's going to happen. I, I just don't know when. Yeah. What about AR? We, we just saw um, some Magic Leap just raised a billion dollars or something crazy, and they don't have a product in the market yet. Do you think AR glasses are, is that a 10-year or closer to two or three years? We think you got a uh, crystal ball. So there are different types of glasses. Right. Uh, one one is sort of the end all be all glass that you know that look like this or as light as this, um, and uh, can track uh, 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 different objects in space and movement. Um, that is likely five plus years out. The however, maybe here closer is, to ten. Who knows? <laughs> right. There may be glasses before then, mm. um, that aren't huge, thick goggles, that aren't you know, holding tablets in the air, which could be fine, by the way, and, and it's, al it's already working in the enterprise space. But it's the interim mm. uh, glasses. And um, if, we can f if there is a Pokemon Go moment on the software side, I just yeah. saw John Hankey yesterday, actually, yeah. and those, that type of hardware, just as I was talking about for VR, you might have that, just enough of that those sparks flying right. for, Something ignites. for the dry leaves to catch fire. Right. Yeah. It's going to be the helmet. The, v, the AR helmet. We'll be walking around with helmets on. Well, a lot of the AR applications that were originally made were for the military. Right. right? And, I, and I, have, I've, I grew up in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and a lot of my friends were flying you know, Black Hawk helicopters with you know, AR visors on their helmets years ago. And so uh, there's a lot of learnings from that area. I mean, but it... It may be that the applications you see initially may be very specialized or, or, or niche, you know, Let's uh, take for a, enterprise or for particular activities. Enterprise seems motorcycle like Motorcycle helmets, whatever it is. Yeah, motorcycles. Uh, but just enterprise is such a layup. Like if you're working on some huge engine, to be able to have the AR showing you each part number and what the comparison of the blade would be in this versus a worn blade versus a damaged blade, like... And, and having it correlate, or for surgeons, yeah. this stuff seems to be so, so low-hanging fruit. I mean, I, I don't know why we don't have AR for surgeons at this point already. Why but is that not a standard? I think AR for maintenance and repair uh, is, I mean, there are companies out there building. I haven't seen apps. it in market yet. I'm looking for an AR company that's doing something in enterprise mm -hmm. that would make the error rate of a doctor significantly less, like do low double digit percentage reduction in error rate, 20% less errors, 30% less errors, because you yeah. think about the cost of an error on a jet plane or a jet engine or the cost of error on a, a, a surgeon. Right. If you could reduce that five or 10%, the error, the error is somebody dying or you know, a plane going down. I mean, this is serious you know, stakes and it would make it well worth double the salary. I mean, people, what would people pay for that 10,000 a month? 100000 a month? I mean, it's incomprehensible how valuable that could be. I agree. I think it could be really valuable. And, but think about the companies also that, are developing, that would be developing the tools for developers to create different apps for those different industries, oh, yeah. right? Maybe so that's the better The whole point. ecosystem, like yeah. the, the picks and the shovels that you'd give to people who do create uh, specific uh, applications, I think, is going to be huge as well. And so we, we look at both the sort of the top of the stack, but we're also looking into, well, what kind of ecosystem would have to develop? What kind of tools would you have to create? Are there marketplaces for this type of stuff? And Questions? I think for entrepreneurs, I think it's a huge opportunity. Let's take two questions. Uh, you have one from the chat room? I do. Okay, from the live stream, Jackie's from reading. From the live stream, we have a question um, from Iqbal. How do you differentiate between the chicken and egg concept, having the idea you need access to resources, and the other hand, attraction for it? So how do, how do, when you have this chicken and egg, you for an, an uh, emerging space. How do you get investor interest, do you think? How do you get you as an investor interested? Uh, well, I think you, first of all, call it and yeah. say we're actually at a chicken and egg moment. Yeah, so uh, being candid about, yeah, hey, this is, what it, this is where we're at. That's right, and, and guess what? We are the egg, we are the chicken. Yeah. And um, how, how we see this market evolving is X, Y, Z. And by the way, if it's not this, this is a plan B approach. And I think just having that kind of vision, I think, is important. Mm. I think to be able to point it to other areas, 
particularly that you've been involved in, where you help make a market or help stimulate a market, lends you a lot of credibility. Yeah, there's a hack there I always tell people, which is if you don't have the credibility yourself, but let's say it was this example of creating the tools to make the experiences, well, why not hire somebody who worked at AutoCAD or whatever 3D modeling company that made the, the, the tutorial system for the previous generation right. in 2D? Yeah. If you had that person or the sales executive who sold in yeah. to those people, wow, now you're starting on second base. You have credibility. I think that's a great point. And in fact, what, what we're seeing a lot more is uh, startups who have advisors from who have subject matter expertise and their involvement may differ but they do lend a lot of credibility and especially if they're actually genuinely involved and have embraced the product so that's a really important signal as well yeah and the way i tell people to structure those deals is 25 to 50 basis points vested monthly over two years and a candid scope of what the commitment will be. I will meet with you quarterly, I will meet with you weekly, I will meet with you monthly, whatever it is, one hour. Put the actual hours of the commitment into the actual document when you talk to your attorneys and have it vest monthly. And here's the downside. Um, your, your total downside for either party is we get to month five and it's not working and you've vested one, you know, uh, whatever it is, five of 24 months, it's what, yeah. 36 months, whatever you choose. It's really not that big of a risk to take and the potential of them opening a door yeah. could be huge. Right, and, but by the way, I think you also want to ask and check into the motivations for why they want to work with a startup. Mm. And what, what is it that, why are they there? And why would they commit to you? And if it's because they see you as a great way to expand their knowledge, expand their network, to learn about how technology is gonna disrupt what they do, then you, then you have the potential for a really interesting partnership there. Right, and if yeah. they see value in the equity, right? Like, I mean, yeah. if the equity has no value, then they would ask for cash, or they would just not be interested. So it's actually That's a little right. bit of a tell. Yeah, I, I get offered equity in vapor companies all the time. People are like, can we give you 10% for free? I'm like, of what? There's nothing here. Like, no, I don't, I'd rather pay for my equity and, but get some milestones completed. Let's take a question, go. Um, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering what I know. I noticed this uh, isn't really a hot topic right now, but like the smart smart TV market, it seems like a very fragmented space between Google, Apple, you guys, et place, etc. What are your? Is there any focus within Samsung on really building out that app ecosystem and all that jazz, or is it kind of moved over to other things, etc.? So. Oh, I, I'm, that's a great question. Um, and in fact, it's highly relevant to us. Because while, while we work very closely with our mobile group, we also work with our, our TV group. And uh, in fact, I, I have another, did you know, <laughs> for you about our TV business. Did you, did you know that back in 2009, uh, Samsung TVs were the first ones to develop an app marketplace, yeah. an app store for connected TVs. So there have been... Uh, there have been efforts before to really refer to it as a smart TV. That was like a brand thing. And to really think about the TV as really a huge connected display, mm -hmm. right? And while it is by far the best and clearest screen to give you a great linear broadcast TV experience, if it's connected, it can also give you great sort of over-the-top app experiences as well. And so there, there is actually a dedicated group. All they think about every day in the TV group is is software and services. And so we work with that group. Um, more, most recently, we helped acquire a company that was based in Toronto to help uh, build an ad ecosystem with them. They have partnered with another startup company called Sorensen, uh, where they are creating basically a, a network using online and offline to create a really big distribution network for advertising. So there's a lot of uh, of interest, uh, a lot of energy being put into how do you make the TV more than just a TV, but a really smart TV, and, and that requires different types of apps. And yeah, um, they're constantly getting upgraded. I, I have two Samsung TVs, and yeah. um, the um, little rainbow button, it was mm -hmm. called Smart Hub, or yep. Smart, it's called Smart Hub, I think. Well, uh, yeah, are you talking about, there's also a button called Extra, Oh, okay. You press that as yeah, well. no, I, I think on mine, it's a, it's a two-year-old TV. Yeah. But you press that little rainbow button, and boom, all of a sudden, you have every service. So I put an yeah. Apple TV on the computer, and nobody, yeah. Apple com TV, and nobody uses it. Everybody just presses the one on the, on the uh, Smart Hub, but it's got a great browser built into it, and all the apps are already there. That's right. And it gets better and better. And in fact, what it I... It keeps updating, is my point. Like, I keep every 
three, six months, I get an over-the-air update. Yeah, I, the, the, um, I always tell people, if you're a Netflix fan, the best Netflix experience you can have is actually the Netflix app that's, that's uh, integrated with the smart TV because they actually custom integrate it every year. Mm. Um, and so you don't have to sort of attach other things to it. But so to your question, um, that is of interest. If you have ideas of how to improve that experience, uh, if you have different apps or service ideas, like I think there's a lot of interest to hear it. In fact, we are very interested in these second screen experiences. If you guys recall, there was a lot of investment dollars put into the space war. So while watching TV, you could have an experience on a tablet or your mobile device to in parallel to what you're watching. And we had a startup actually within our within our group that basically created a second screen experience on the first screen, so it would be in parallel, and, and now it's built into the TV. I just want them to do that for Game of Thrones because literally <laughs> I have to put the subtitles on because right. I can't follow the story. I watch this show every week, <laughs> and I, I can't remember the characters' names. I don't know where the different places are. I need to have, like, literally, I need to get a tutor <laughs> so that afterwards that somebody can you realize when you say this, this somebody's going to go out there and create an app for this because I literally you know, need a Game of Thrones tutor because I can't <laughs> so what I do now is I don't know if anybody else has done this but before I watch the next episode I go on YouTube and people make little mini episodes for people who can't follow the story <laughs> where they literally are like okay we know you're an idiot you didn't read the books number one this is Cersei's this is Dracarys means fire, and they just, one by one, I just need to hit the button, extras, and have it put the character names on them. Right. So far, extra has been more focused on sporting events and yeah, news no. and weather, but that's... No, they're making these shows way too complicated. I'll, I'll, too many plot lines. I'll pass that on, Jason. Please. I'll pass by all it means. on. And you guys are not in the content business. You are, you're not competing with Apple. Is now doing a couple TV shows, Amazon, yeah. Netflix. You, you're not in that business. We are not. Having come from that business, I will tell you, while uh, you never say never, that is uh, consciously a decision we have, have made. It's a hard business. It's a hard business. It's an unpredictable business. It's an expensive business. And what people forget is it's a, a trade. It takes specialization in people yeah. who do it. Yeah, just like uh, making uh, software and hardware. Turns out. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think Netflix is making TVs anytime soon. Uh, all right, on that note, uh, let's uh, thank David Un. I, I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, sure. Okay, so. great. Uh, and he's always available. He spends a lot of time with startups. Right, so thank you. Great job. <laughs>